the next chess man we consider is the impartial green rook. The conventional chess rook can move vertically or horizontally. He can move any number of squares in any of four directions. But the diagonal plague disables two of these directions, allowing him to move only westward or southward. As we did with the king, we'll begin these studies by considering a simpler case. When the rook is on the bottom row, he can move in only one direction. We'll then call him a baby rook, denoted by the lowercase r. When played alone, a well-played game of baby rook lasts at most one move. The location of the end of the board is a circle. All other locations are check marks. The next simplest impartial chess game is the sum of two baby rooks. What is the winning strategy? The answer is to line them up on the same column. Suppose our opponent, red, then has to play from such a position. He'll have to move one rook westward. We'll then respond by moving the other rook to the same column. And any red move by either rook will leave them in different columns, which blue can then restore. This continues until the game ends. Red will lose and blue will win. Numbering the columns makes it convenient to record a game which includes one or more baby rooks. When playing the sum of two baby rooks, the winning strategy is to match their file numbers. We next consider the impartial green bishop. The conventional chess bishop moves diagonally. He can move any number of squares in any of four directions. But the diagonal plague disables three of these directions, allowing him to move only southwestward. Suppose the game of impartial bishop is played alone. Then which locations are circles from which the previous player has won, and which are the check marks from which the next player can win? The answer is very easy. The game ends in one move. Only the boundary locations adjacent to the west and south borders are circles. We next consider the sum of the bishop and the baby rook. What is the winning strategy? Here's a particular example. If blue moves first from this starting position, his only winning move is to bring the rook onto the same column as the bishop. If red then moves the bishop, blue responds by moving the baby rook to restore the alignment. Or, if red moves the rook, then blue restores the alignment by moving the bishop onto the same column. Evidently, if the bishop is located above the diagonal, his column is the number the baby rook should match, as we can see by repeating the prior game with locations numbered. But what if the bishop is located below the diagonal? Then it is his row number that the baby rook needs to match. Here's a well-played game. So the relevant number on the bishop's board above the diagonal is the column index, but below the diagonal it is the row index. These location numbers are called the Grundy numbers after the early 20th century mathematician P. M. Grundy. The winning strategy for playing B plus R is to match their Grundy numbers unless they are already equal, in which case you cannot win unless your opponent makes an error. Let's next consider the game of twin baby rooks. They occupy different locations, but since they are twins, they reside on the same board. Like all impartial green chessmen, they are immortal. They cannot capture or be captured, nor can they jump over one another. What is the winning strategy for playing the single game of twin baby rooks? Answer. Move the eastern rook westward up against the other. 
the opponent can then only play the western rook away from the eastern rook, after which you can then press the eastern rook up against him again, as we see in this sample game. Next, consider the sum of the bishop plus the twin baby rooks. It turns out that the numbers of the locations on each twin baby rook matter less than the number of empty squares between them. That number of empty intervening squares between the twins is their Grundy number. In this example, it's three, but the bishop's Grundy number is four. If blue moves first, he can make the match by playing the bishop from four to three. If red then increases the twins' number to anything bigger than three, blue can then reverse that Grundy number back to three. If red then plays the bishop from three to one, blue can respond by playing the baby rook's number to also become one. If red increases the twins' Grundy number, then blue can again reverse it back to one. Eventually, red must play one Grundy number to zero, and blue then wins by playing the other number to zero as well. The winning strategy for playing bishop plus baby rook, or bishop plus twin baby rooks, is to match their Grundy numbers. If the Grundy numbers of the two boards are the same, the previous player can win. If not, then the next player can win. His canonical winning move is on the board with the higher Grundy number, which he can play to another location which matches the lower Grundy number. What are the properties of the Grundy numbers which make our matching strategy so successful? First, when the game is over, the Grundy number is zero. The second condition is that the Grundy numbers of the immediate followers of X must include all non-negative integers less than the Grundy number of X. And the third condition is that all of them must be different from the Grundy number of X itself. So if after we've found the Grundy numbers of all of the followers called X prime, then we can find the Grundy number of X. The method for doing so can be expressed as a formula, which states that the Grundy number of X is the mex over all X prime of the Grundy number of X prime, where here mex, M-E-X, stands for the minimal excludent. It is the smallest number not in the specified set. 